Welcome adventurers, what's going on guys? My name is Cody and this is Taking 20, a channel about all things role-playing games. And I would like to welcome you back to Wrath and Glory Week here on the channel. Today, I'll be covering the five different types of species that you can play in Wrath and Glory and giving you a bit of a background on each of them as well as their mechanical differences. Let's get started. There are five species that come as playable races in Wrath and Glory. The humans locked into their stagnating ways in the 41st millennium. The Eldar, a superior race that has seen the rise and death of their empire through their own decadence and birth of the dark god Slanesh. The Orc, a brutal race that was bioengineered for war. And the Adeptus Astartes, the mechanically enhanced humans that first filled the ranks of the Space Marines during the Great Crusade, including the Primaris Astartes, a new wave of super soldiers that has been enhanced upon even further in order to combat the ever dangerous threat of chaos that corrupted the legions of Adeptus Astartes into the original chaos space marines. Let's start by taking a closer look at the orcs or green skins as they're often called. Orcs is the name given to the numerous different subspecies belonging to the overall orc tribes and clans. From the smaller Grots and Gretchens used as slave labor for the tribe to the enormous Squigoth that can dwarf a main battle tank all fall into the category one would call an orc. Orcs in the 41st millennium are as much a disease as they are a species. Originally designed by the Old Ones over 60 million years ago to fight the Old Ones' greatest enemy, the Necrons, Orcs are driven by their one singular purpose, war. As such, Orcs are the perfect overwhelming force of warriors throughout the galaxy and are only outnumbered by the Tyranid, a mutating Xenos of world devouring power themselves. Orcs do not breed in traditional sense, as they were bioengineered with plants during their creation by the Old Ones, and instead grow underneath the ground in fungal cocoons. This is actually the cause for their bright green skin, as they have been mutated with chlorophyll, though they don't exactly photosynthesize. This also allows orcs to reproduce asexually by shedding orc spores throughout their life, which can grow on almost any planet. This is one of the reasons that the Imperium of Man considers a planet both diseased and doomed if it is found to be infected with orcs, and it often becomes a matter of when, not if, the entire planet is decimated by the brutal species. Groups of orcs are led by their war boss, typically the biggest, most merciless of the clan. And some might even say that they literally need battle to survive. They live their entire lives to war, as was their original creator's purpose for them. And they do it well, even when outmatched by more technologically advanced foes, as if by sheer will and enjoyment of battle. All orcs join one of six clans, which even when they seem to be isolated on a distant planet, are incredibly consistent. The Golf Clan relying on massive infantry, the Evil Sons who utilize the fastest vehicles possible, the Bad Moons who are the most technologically advanced of their brethren, the Death Skulls who instead look to steal tech from enemies and adapt it to their own ends, the Blood Axes who rely much more heavily on tactics than their kin, and the Snake Bites who depend on squig-based weapons in place of more standard technology. Okay, let's quickly look over this species abilities for orcs. First, we see that they have a build point cost of 10. We can create characters with them even at tier one. They have an average speed coming in at six. They gain a plus one bonus to toughness, though they do struggle when interacting with the Imperium. They also gain a plus one bonus to intimidation tests and they substitute their strength total for fellowship when calculating their overall influence. In addition to this, each orc will belong to one of the aforementioned orc clans, picking up additional bonuses specific to that clan and can take on one of three different archetypes, the orc boy, the orc commando, and the orc knob, which I'll touch on on a later video covering many of the different archetypes available or classes here in Wrath and Glory. Next up, we have the Eldar, the psychically enhanced ancient species. But first, I want to give a huge shout out and thank you to my sponsor for this video, Miniature Market. Miniature Market was the driving force behind Wrath and Glory Week here on the channel. And for that, I'm just incredibly appreciative. 
I personally use Miniature Market and recommend them to gamers. Miniature Market is an online gamer's paradise with the largest selections you'll find anywhere and with pricing that will genuinely shock you. They carry all of the latest board games, hard to find GM screens and special release covers, card games, miniatures, and more. And if you're looking for a place to find all of the Wrath and Glory releases, Miniature Market has already got you covered. I'll put a link to them down in the description below where it'll take you right to their entire Wrath and Glory lineup so you guys can check them out for yourselves. The history of the Eldar is perhaps the deepest and most complex of any species in the 41st millennium. Also created by the Old Ones in their struggle against the Necrons, the Eldar were psychically sensitive and far more advanced than any other species known in history. After the War of the Heavens, the Eldar found themselves uniquely positioned as bastions of progress, guided by their many psychically formed Eldar gods, and eventually the Eldari Empire found itself unchallenged by any other force ruling the entire galaxy for millions of years. The Eldari Empire grew and expanded, utilizing their psychic powers. They achieved new heights that none before and none after, including the Imperium of Man, would even come close to. They created an existence so perfect that they didn't have to work, leaving the Eldar of the Eldari Empire with not much left to pursue through their lives other than their own personal gratifications. Becoming more and more desensitized to their existence and pleasures, they soon began to seek darker pleasures, sating their boredom and ever-numbing desires with bloodlust and depravity. Never enough to the Eldar, they continued to decline into the black pit of their own existence and debasement, unknowingly bringing about their own doom. But while the majority found itself slipping into the darkness of their own making, a few groups of Eldar believed that the race's decline was heading towards an unsustainable level and left to make their own lives on the fringes of the Eldari Empire, referred to as the Exodites. And still other groups of Eldar sensitive to precognitions feared a similar outcome, creating huge artificial planet-sized ships called craft worlds in an attempt to flee the impending doom of the Eldar race. The dark psychic energies of the Eldar continued to grow within the warp, creating an ever larger warp storm during what other species would call the Age of Strife, a period in which interstellar travel was, in essence, impossible. With the Eldar using their own webways for similar travel, they didn't really take heed of the amassing destruction that they were doomed to bring upon themselves. And in a huge explosion of dark psychic energies born from a reflection of what the Eldari Empire had become, the dark god Slanesh was born. This explosion traveled thousands of light years, instantly eradicating the Eldar on their core worlds and extending so far as to even tear the souls from the bodies of the huge craft worlds that had not traveled far enough yet. In mere moments, the Eldari Empire ceased to exist, with the few remaining Eldar on the verge of extinction. The Eye of Terror remaining where the fabric of reality had been torn asunder. The great daemons, once needing to be summoned into this plane of existence, now found themselves free of those restraints, bringing many, many horrors with them beyond just the devastating birth of the dark god Slanesh. And this is where the Eldar find themselves 10,000 years later in the 41st millennium, a fractured race that seeks both a brighter future and an existence that rebuffs their previous empire. Okay, let's quickly look over the species abilities for the Eldar. First, we see that they have a build point cost of 10. We can also create characters with them even at tier one. They have an above average speed coming in at eight. They gain a plus one bonus to agility, though they also struggle when interacting with the Imperium. And due to their intense emotions, they struggle with resolve tests. And anytime they fail a willpowered based test involved intense emotions, they grant the GM an additional point of ruin. On the flip side, the Eldari will give players access to three unique archetypes, the Corsair, the Ranger, and of course, the Warlock. Okay, let's slide over to humans and the Imperium of Man. I touched a bit on their history and origin in my quick start video, so I won't go into too much depth here, 
But life for humanity has been and will continue to be a constant struggle of their manifest destiny and need for survival. There are billions upon billions of humans all across the galaxy, and for those who remain in the Imperium of Man, paranoia plays a much larger role in their outlook than one might expect of a race that had over one million planets under its control before the arrival of the Cicatrix Maledictum, the enormous rift storm that split the Imperium of Man nearly in half. But with the corruption of Horus during the Horus Heresy, the Imperium of Man is still licking its wounds thousands of years later, and the internal battle against the these forces and corrupted cultists of chaos is one that humans are expected to constantly remain vigilant against. As such, innovation and education are frowned upon, even for those engineers and mechanics who are needed to keep the Imperium running efficiently, which is no small task, and the reason that the Imperium, if anything else, is swathed in bureaucracy and red tape. If you've ever heard the phrase, there's a place for everything and everything is in its place, you'll have a good idea on what it's like to belong to the Imperium of Man and probably guess how slow things move when something actually needs to be done. Human psychers, those who show an aptitude for psychic sensitivity, are required to be officially sanctioned and even those that are are sent off to the black ships where their powers can be better controlled, trained, and utilized. And overall life in the Imperium is one of servitude to the greater good as unfortunately the Imperium has had entire worlds wiped from existence by self-imposed cleansing after Tyranid and Orc infestations and invasions. Though this may not have been widely accepted in the Imperium at the time, it is unfortunately something that is just part of its history. When it comes to special abilities, humans are more or less a blank canvas, receiving no special abilities of note, but also not taking up any build points during character's creation. However, humans have by far the most available archetypes available to them, and players will be able to create many, many different types of characters with numerous playstyles if they choose to go this route. In total, there are 22 archetypes that have prerequisites of human. However, of these 22 archetypes, they each fall under one of seven different categories, so you'll need to talk with your GM when determining what type of game and campaign you'll be playing in first. Okay, and finally, let's talk about the youngest of the species in Wrath and Glory, the Adeptus Astartus, or as they might more commonly be known as, the Space Marines. Before setting off on the Great Crusade, the Emperor of Man created the Adeptus Astartus, a legion of men who were physically altered through mechanical implants and genetic mutation. Each of these men were then separated into one of 20 different Space Marine legions and further enhanced with specific gene seeds of that legion's godlike Primarch generals. After the Horus Heresy, where nine of these 20 legions fell to the corruption of chaos, the remaining legions were then reorganized into 1,000 legions, each with 1,000 space marines in its company. And while in the millennia since the Horus Heresy, some of these newly founded legions have turned renegade, the space marines still stand as the most effective force when defending the Imperium. The life of a space marine is one of discipline. Constant training and spiritual conditioning have turned these soldiers into steadfast warriors that face any challenge head on, sacrificing themselves to protect the Imperium if necessary. While most of these Adeptus Astartes start out as Space Marine Scouts, even those who are fully not initiated as a Space Marine are overwhelmingly effective, typically serving as part of a 10-man troop called a Devastation Squad. After rising through the ranks, these Adeptus Astartes receive their final implants and are equipped with their very own set of power armor, where they will likely serve the Imperium until their demise, whether that's during a large-scale assault or possibly during an assigned mission involving other group members outside of their own legion and brethren. Okay, let's look at the Adeptus Astartes species abilities. As you might imagine, the Adeptus Astartes build point cost is the highest, well, one of the highest in the game that you'll find, coming in at a whopping 50 points. You'll need at least to be tier two before they even become an option for you. They have a solid speed of seven. They gain quite a few bonuses to attributes, gaining a plus one bonus to strength, a plus one bonus to agility, to toughness and resolve. They pick up help with 
Angel of Death, which allows them to be more effective against mobs, though they are bound to their chapter's beliefs and orders. And finally, they are resistant to effects that might cause bleed because the Adeptus Astartes simply don't bleed. Also, I would be remiss to not mention the Primaris Astartes, which are in essence Space Marines 2.0. For the sake of brevity, I'll simply say that the Primaris Astartes were created in response to the corruption of the first few Chaos Space Marines. And while they are still very new in the Imperium, at least relative to the Adeptus Astartes, their effect on morale has been a much needed one throughout the entirety of the Imperium. As it stands in the core rulebook, the Primaris Astartes only has one archetype available to it and has a minimum tier of four. But when I spoke with Wrath and Glory's lead game designer, Ross Watson, he assured me that more archetypes are in the works for the Primaris Astartes with future Wrath and Glory releases. I want to once again thank Miniature Market for helping me bring Wrath and Glory Week here to the channel. And I want to give a huge shout out to all of the kick-ass patrons over at welcomeadventures.com. If you enjoyed this video and you want to support more content like this, welcomeadventures.com is a great way to support the channel while picking up some exclusive rewards for yourself. If this is your first time here and you love role-playing games as much as I do, I'd love to have you subscribe. Every week I put out new videos on GM tips, player tips, tutorials, and more. So if that sounds like something you might be interested in, just hit that subscribe button down below and come join us. Thank you guys so much for watching. My name is Cody, and may your games be filled with awesome memories and even better friends. I'll catch you guys next time. Yeah.